Good afternoon. As folks start coming back from lunch, we're going to get started just to sort of keep on our schedule of time. So I do hope that you enjoy lunch and um, be happy that you're back. And this afternoon session is strictly going to be, we're going to have a series of different panels and presentations. The first panel we're going to have from some of the faculty in the School of Science who's going to speak about some of the opportunities, some of the research opportunities, some of what they're doing, and how students can get involved or participate in some of the work that they do. Now, keep in mind that as much as you may think then that, yes, we know this is a college, but high school students also have an opportunity to engage in partnering with us and, and being part of the, the research team because we feel that we want to be able to have continuity. So the continuity is going to occur if we include students from the high school level, the college students, so we have the college students who can mentor the high school students, faculty members who mentor the college students. So I mean, that's a pipeline, and that's what we're going to continue to embrace and, and to continue. So the first presentation is going to be our science presentation. As I did say before, from, um, you're going to see a video short clip of some of the research that faculty is doing in, in the department. Following that presentation, we could have someone from um, the City University of New York, the Director of Industrial Academic Research. Now, that's um, Dr. John Blaho. And Dr. Blaho works, he has worked with faculty members in helping them to do startups, start up their businesses, and he's been very successful in doing that through different grants that he has acquired. So Dr. Blaho is going to speak somewhat on that process and how folks are able to take advantage of those opportunities. Next following that we're going to have an entrepreneurial presentation and again, because we've partnered with the School of Business, we feel that we want students to take a different outlook as far as when you look at what you do at school and to be able to connect it because when, you, when it's all said and done, when you think of school, you graduate from college, there are three fundamental tenets or three tracks that one can pursue. One can either get involved in entrepreneurship, one can go to grad school, or the world of work. So each of those are very important, but we feel that the entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial part is one that's been missing along the way, so we want to really engage and incorporate the entrepreneurship as part of the, um, the conversation. So we're going to have a presentation, entrepreneurship presentation. And finally, we're going to have a policy presentation, and of course some wonderful speakers who is going to be here speaking on public policy issues as it pertains to the environment. So, and of course at the end of the day we have our closing prizes and our pitch competition. Just to remind you, the students that's in the audience, the high school students and college students, a 45 second pitch on next steps. What you've learned and what you intend to do after this, this uh, conference is over. And of course, you have opportunity to win prizes as a result of that process. So with no further ado. I just wanted to add, the competition is not for high school students only, but all you middle school students, we have some cash prizes for you. So please, okay. take part in of that. Middle school, high school, college students, you're all open to the opportunity. And again, remember what some of the speakers said this morning, communication. Again, you again, communication. So this is an opportunity for you to be able to articulate yourself in a cogent manner based on what you've learned and what your next steps are. So we look forward to your presentations. So now I'm going to call on James. You can start the video. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Michele Pitarello. I'm an associate professor of chemistry in the Department of Chemistry and Environmental Science at Agrarius College of the University of New York. Uh, my research group, and uh, in particular, Dr. Shilpi in the school, my outstanding uh, uh, research associate, are concerned with different topics of research. We, we uh, research factories in general and little capital devices. We also research protein purification, radio remediation. We're also concerned with uh, photosynthesis and respiration, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Photosynthesis and respiration are two biochemical processes of great importance on the planet. Uh, they enable life in its uh, plant and animal forms, and uh, we are interested in studying these processes from the point of view of nanotechnology and materials chemistry. Uh, in particular, uh, photosynthesis and, uh, and uh, respiration are essentially mirror processes. Uh, photosynthesis splits water to give rise to oxygen, while respiration turns oxygen into water. 
and the net energy input is uh, light from the sun. So what we do is to isolate uh, the protein from the, the uh, photosynthetic and mitochondrial electric transport chain from bacterial resources. As you can see over here, we isolate, for example, uh, a protein called photosystem 1 from cyanobacteria. And then we take these proteins and we reassemble the mitochondrial and the photosynthetic electric transport chain on photographene oxide. Well, graphene oxide is, is a nanomaterial which is only uh, one atom thick. Uh, it's, a, it's a newly rediscovered material that we have studied and in, in characterized very extensively. Once we assemble the proteins on the surface of graphene oxide, we, we obtain what we call galvanic biohybrid uh, systems that we characterize either by optical or by gradual spectroscopy and also surface characterization methods such as atomic post microscopy. Once we study this material, we get the experimental data, we also uh, interpret the data and analyze them using quantum mechanical models and molecular simulations. The objective of this study is to uh, study photosynthesis and re respiration per se, but we're also interested in understanding the, uh, the limitations of human performance and biological performance in living organisms. There are practical uh, applications for our studies. The material that we use to mobilize the protein on the surface can also be used for protein purification, which is uh, and the materials of interest to the pharmaceutical industry. So um, we conduct this research with students at the uh, undergraduate level, at the high school level, uh, we have graduate students and also postdoctoral fellows. Hi, I'm Professor Sin at the Department of Chemistry and Environment Science. And my research area is developing analytical method for the trace organic compound and the trace inorganic compound in the water or air and soil sediment samples. From this measurement, I'm trying to find out patent transport of those toxic chemicals in our urban atmosphere and in the air also to see uh, the effect of those compounds of public health. And I'm currently working with the Further Silica Foundation and the New Newton Creek Alliance for the water quality and air quality monitoring. And I'm currently working with the EPA granted project to see the greenhouse gas emission. So this is one of the instruments what I'm using at the field for the greenhouse gas sampling and to see the, how much of the tidal uh, is impacting emission of the carbon dioxide or nitrous dioxide. Yeah, I'm really excited collaborating with the students. Uh, we don't hand on experience in the field, in the laboratory with our state art of the instrument for the analytical and the sample analysis. My name is Uluashi Salako. I'm an assistant professor here at McDaggers College my, uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Environmental Science. My area of research has to do with gas hydrates. Gas hydrates are compounds formed as a result of the trapping of gas molecules like methane in cages of ice. The, some of the um, applications of gas hydrate has to do with uh, transportation of gases, storage of gases, because essentially we are storing um, uh, uh, gases in ice, provides a more safer option compared to um, the pressurized method that is being used. Uh, we can also use gas technology for desalination of seawater and for separation of blue gases. Now, one um, aspect of gas hydrate that really interests researchers is the um, existence of a lot of methane uh, that are stored in form of gas hydrate deep in the ocean. It has been estimated that about, uh, about twice the amount of fossil fuel that has already been discovered exists in form of gas hydrates uh, deep in the ocean. So gas hydrate serves as um, this um, unconventional uh, energy resource. The negative aspect of gas hydrate is that the, it, it, it's the new sounds in the oil and gas industry. And what I mean by that is 
they sometimes form in the pipes that carry crude oil and so they affect the, the crude oil production, the oil and gas industry. And so there they have also been high profile incidents like the explosion in the Gulf of Mexico that led to the death of a lot of um, people. And so what, we, what I uh, do in my laboratory is to try to understand the formation of gas hydrates. The challenge uh, of uh, the, the, the formation of gas hydrates is very slow. And so we utilize um, surfactants, which are these soap-like molecules that are absorbed at the, on the surface of gas hydrates to stop them from clogging together. And this clogging is what uh, slows down the rate of gas hydro formation. If you want to do research in my laboratory, what you will learn about is how to make this gas hybrid. You will learn about um, how to measure surfactant uh, solutions that help us to study the formation of gas hybrids. You will also learn how to use this equipment called the Zeller uh, sizer to study the absorption of surfactant on gas hybrids. You will also learn how to use high pressure reactors to do gas hydro formation. You will also learn how to use rheometers to study the flow properties of gas hydrates in pipes. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Denton, and I'm one of the research faculty here at Mega Adverse and Chemistry and Environmental Science uh, Department. My research focuses on the use of microwave as uh, instrument as shown here. And this instrument is actually used to, to do uh, chemistry in the lab. Now, just like you know, microwave is used at home uh, to speed up your, uh, to heat up your food uh, very quickly. Uh, in the lab, we use microwave uh, to speed up reactions, meaning that reactions that will take uh, for hours, maybe four or five hours, can be done in minutes or even seconds uh, using the microwave. So as a result of that, the microwave is very good uh, for speeding up reactions, also good uh, in terms of uh, environmental benefits of uh, using less waste because we use less organic solvents that are, that are normally generated in conventional uh, synthesis. And uh, this is a plus, especially for, for uh, chemists and for the environment. Uh, two, uh, my project that I'm used, that I'm actually involved in, uh, involved synthesis of uh, a very useful product, uh, lycopodic acid, which is a natural product isolated from mushrooms. So this natural product is similar to uh, the glutamic acid, which binds to glutamate receptors, and as a result, uh, it can be used to somehow activate or deactivate uh, the central. Uh, glutamate receptors in the central nervous system. So uh, my research in that sense uh, is focused more on understanding Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, these diseases that have to do with the central nervous system. Uh, our next project, uh, which is a very good project that we're looking at, is extracting uh, some very small compounds which we call furfurols. These furfurols help us to determine how fresh uh, the honey that you use uh, in the supermarket where it comes of how fresh it is. And uh, these compounds are also happen that if you have too much of these compounds, the honey is not so fresh. Well, those are two of the exciting projects that we have. And if you join my group, definitely you'll learn how to uh, do organic synthesis. You'll also learn not only to make compounds, but how to actually uh, isolate and characterize these compounds using some of the instruments that we have here at at Mega Evers uh, College. And not only that, but you'll also uh, be somehow uh, involved in the, the biological aspect of, the com of these compounds that you make, which we will uh, definitely link up with the biology department uh, to help to, to do biological studies. I am Dr. Rajapaksha from Chemistry and Environmental Department. Uh, I'm very excited to share this uh, research during this moment. And uh, my research primarily focuses on uh, metal-based probes to study molecular interactions. 
So there are applications in both environmental and medical fields. Uh, one of the major applications is that um, you can use um, protein incorporated nanoparticles to selectively remove heavy metals from complex uh, solutions. So uh, I study protein and heavy metal interactions and given the high affinity, I incorporated, incorporate those proteins into the nanoparticles and then removal will be biocompatible. And you can even uh, incorporate these uh, nanoparticles into uh, straws, for an example, using 3D printing, and you can uh, remove the uh, heavy metals as you drink through the straw. That's one of the exciting projects I have. And there you will learn how to fabricate the nanoparticles, how to incorporate proteins, and how to purify proteins from different sources, and also um, how to uh, quantify the affinities between different molecule proteins and uh, different heavy metals. So that's one of the projects and another application is that I'm very excited about uh, lanthanide special characteristics. Lanthanide chemistry is very different from all the other chemistries you find on uh, in any other element you find on the periodic table. They have long lifetime luminescence, that's the most exciting property they have. And other than that, they have their characteristic uh, spectra that are very different for different lanthanide metal ions. And those characters can be used to um, uh, study them or use them as uh, good probes to study protein interactions. So uh, these uh, probes can be uh, synthesized uh, in the lab and these probes uh, can be in, uh, introduced into the cells and you can selectively label proteins using these probes and when the proteins are interacting these probes will uh, give out the same signal and because these signals are long-lived you can eliminate the background signal before you collect the signal from your probe and that way you can increase the resolution uh, for an example temporal and spatial resolution of your detection so you can study um, protein interactions that cannot be studied using other methods. So in this project, you will get experience um, synthesizing different organic molecules and um, characterizing these molecules and also working with cell culture because um, you will have to uh, in to, um, introduce these probes into the cells. So you will get experience in working with cells and uh, then studying cells using microscope and I'm also planning to build a time resolve uh, microscope in the department and you will learn how to use the time resolve microscope to study these protein interactions as well. So I think there are a uh, lot of other uh, in interesting projects as well as there is a lot of room for your own creativity also in my lab. So I invite you to come and have a peek and share this exciting research with me. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Dr. Pratt, and we're going to do some trash talking in the hood. Or more correctly, we're going to be doing some trash talking in front of a hood. This thing here is called a fume hood, or a hood for short. Why are we doing trash talking? Well, we're using all kinds of trash. Municipal garbage, sewer grease, various types of industrial waste, waste plastic, and so on, to make fuel. We're interested primarily in two types of fuel. Biodiesel, which some of you may have heard of. It's the fatty acid methyl ester, and it is used in diesel engines as a blend or as a replacement for petroleum diesel. Green diesel is another type of fuel that we make, and that's more or less chemically identical to petroleum diesel, and we make it uh, by slightly different processes that we're developing in the lab here. We all know that biodiesel can be made from waste vegetable oil, but there's a shortage of the waste vegetable oil supply. So we're looking at other sources of waste oils to make biodiesel. It's more difficult to do, but here we're developing new processes to do it. Green diesel is made by pyrolysis, or breaking down of chemicals with heat to make other smaller molecules. And in the background here, we have a set of reactions using brown grease, 
or grease that is derived from the sewage system. We're doing a lot of good science here, but we're also interested in the business aspect of things, and we're looking towards commercialization, looking at the commercial feasibility of the projects, and we have a plans collaboration with the School of Business here at Medgar Evers College. We're also doing some international work with groups in Malaysia and Vietnam, and I've placed several students in uh, summer internships, both internationally and domestically. One of them was at a biodiesel company in Connecticut, others were in Vietnam and Malaysia. A couple of our success stories, among others, our recent graduates uh, were Travis Pennock, who is now a partner of a small business, Omar Gardner, who works for the Department of the Interior, and Joel Struthers, who is a recent graduate, headed to graduate school soon. Students and faculty conduct their research in Medgar Evers state-of-the-art research facility, where they use our enviable collection of scientific instrumentation, such as gas chromatograph mass spectrometers, plasma mass spectrometers, high-performance oh. liquid chromatography, IR and UV spectroscopy, thermal gravimetry, nuclear magnetic resonance, X-ray diffractometry, and atomic force microscopy as well as a comprehensive synthetic lab where we can handle even sensitive materials. New technologies are developed using modern microcontrollers and cutting-edge fabrication techniques like 3D printing. And all with a fabulous view of Brooklyn. All right, so that's an example of some of the opportunities that we have here at Medgivers College, and we encourage you to um, take full advantage of them. So I saw Dr. Blejo just walked in from the back to the front, so I'm going to pull you right up to speak, Dr. Blejo, don't get too comfortable sitting. <laughs> so you're going to share with us um, some of the granting opportunities and some of the stuff that you do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow, I want to do some of that research. It looked great. Can we get the first slide? So before we start, I want to thank Professor Reed for inviting me. Um, I know that some shout outs went to Professor Crump and Dean Roll. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about, no, down, down a bit, thanks. Other way, oh, sorry, it's a PDF, so. Something called the CUNY Innovation Core. Has anybody heard of the CUNY i -Corps? Wow, okay, that's good, more than, more than I expected, I like that. The title really is Enabling CUNY Entrepreneurship. And I have to say that when we began this back in 2016, 2017, Medgar Evers was an early adopter. It was really people like Professor Crump, Dean Roll was a huge supporter of us. And I would say in every cohort that we have run since that time, there has been a large representation for Medgar Evers College. So that's why when I was asked to come here, by Professor Reed, I jumped at the opportunity. I love talking to an auditorium of students who are in environmental sciences and chemistry. This is great. So I'm going to assume, yeah, go ahead, that you all were inspired by that great video and you all want to do research. So I'm going to challenge you that while you're doing your research, and as one of the speakers said, now think about commercial potentials for the research that you do. Because if you think there is one, come to me. And we have an approach. What we do is we get you out of the lab. Do your research in the lab, come up with an idea, then come to me and I'm gonna get you out of the lab to test it. As Professor Mond said, this process of customer discovery, does anybody know what customer discovery means? Go ahead. Exactly. I'm going to repeat that. He said you ask your customers their pain points. It's exactly what you do. So what I like, the way I like to describe it, is we do hypothesis-driven business model creation. The data to test your hypotheses comes from what Professor Mons was talking about: customer discovery. You get out of the lab 
and you talk to potential users and see if your ideas are correct. So it's, an, it's a continuing improvement of your hypotheses. We have a whole process where you make many guesses and you go out and you get data and refine your hypotheses. That is called experiential learning. What I loved about that industry panel, they all said you need experience. So you have an opportunity here at Medgar to do experiential learning. That's what they're looking for. You make a hypothesis, you get out of the lab, you go talk to people, and then you synthesize what you've learned. That's experiential learning, and then you'll have instructor feedback, instructors guiding you. And in order to track your progress, and also for you to refine your hypotheses, we actually have a web-based platform that allows instructors remotely to track your progress. So this is our system. This is what we do. Next slide, please. So what I want to talk about are just two programs that we do. And I'm short. I have five slides, so we're going to go really quick. This is what we call the Innovation Challenge. The Innovation Challenge is our introductory program to entrepreneurship. Not only is it sponsored by the National Science Foundation, it's sponsored by Capital One Bank. Does anybody want to guess why Capital One Bank would want to give you money? Come on, let's go. What's that? Go ahead. That's right. I'm going to repeat what she just said. The bankers think if you're successful, you're going to give them back the money. Yeah. That is exactly right. So the community, the vice president for community affairs at Capital One Bank looks at this room and says, there are business owners in this room. That's how they think about it. And they want you to become successful, hire people, need a banking professionals. That's their business model. Sometimes if you see the Capital One ads, they're changing, you know, they have Capital One cafes. We leverage that. We use, they, they let us use the Capital One cafes for these training programs. That's why Capital One supports us. These are just two groups that I want to point out. And I just want to say, like always saying, proof. I don't know how many people know Anise right here, right? Anise was one of the students that uh, came from the business school. We also have over here, I don't know if anybody knows Akeem and his team from, from Medgar. Yeah, there's the man, there's the man, right? I want to talk to the high school students, right? We had Valerie and Manigal. That's Valerie and that's Manigal. They came from BTEC, Business Technical High School, in Queens, and they participated in the program. So I want to challenge uh, Professor Reed and Professor Crump to say that if you have relationships with the local high schools, especially in environmental science and chemistry, we can take in high school students into our programs and train them. And it's, it's a feeder. It's a way to get those high school students interested in doing environmental science and chemistry and also have them to come to Medgar Evers, right? That's the process. So we can do this. And I would say Manahill, so this is in Queens. And if you remember when Amazon was moving to Queens, Manahill wrote and got published in the Daily News talking about why she wanted Amazon to come. She was a female entrepreneur, and she talks about our training program, who viewed Amazon coming as a potential job for her. And you could look it up. It's in the New York, it's in the Daily News. So she wrote an article about this. Okay, so this is how close you are. You, you, every single person in this room could be in, the, in these slots. So now, I want to jump to the other program that we do. And as I said, look at all of these people that we have. These are just two cohorts that we did. Um, I could pick numerous, numerous examples of success stories and different teams, but I, I, I tried to pick teams that were in the environmental science space. Next slide, please. So our other program is what we call the short course. And this is a Medgar Evers team. Do you remember talking trash in the hood? Roy was working on that project. So remember, when Professor Pratt was talking about he's interested in uh, entrepreneurship and developing the technology, 
Roy was, a gra was an undergraduate student who was working on the project. And this is his talking about recycled materials, making biofuels. But what I want to point out is another team, and, and you, you know, such coincidence. We heard an enormous amount today about where New York City's water comes from. We also heard about sewer water. You understand now, like when there's a storm, the storm sewers, sewers open up and the wastewater gets mixed with the sewer water, or it's a real problem. <clears throat> Yanili, who's a student at, at Bronx Community College, came up with a solution. She, she saw that problem, and she came up with a solution to prevent waste from getting into the sewer system. She went through our program here. And I just want to read what she did. You know, sewage sal salvagers will lower maintenance and repair costs for homeowners by preventing the clogging of submersible drainage systems through filtering de debris that cause infrastructural damage and flooding. And she, had, she did 30 customer discovery interviews to develop that process. Okay, so, so this is someone who just heard of a problem, thought about a problem, and went out and did customer discovery and figured out the solution. So I want to take a pause here. Does anybody know what yesterday was? International Women's Day. Get this? Can I have a round of applause for this old female team? A little known fact that CUNY is recognized nationally for having a leadership role in the amount of women entrepreneurs. All right? And I would go a step further and say women of color entrepreneurs. So much so that last fall, the National Science Foundation reached out to us and asked us to host an inclusion summit in Washington, D.C. And what we did is the National Science Foundation gave us money to invite the presidents and provosts. And we heard uh, one of the speakers talking about the historically black colleges. We also invited provosts and presidents of tribal colleges to Washington, D.C. to partner with them, because we, we lead the country in women of color entrepreneurship. So we are now partnering with the presidents and the provosts of all of these schools to do training and to have them come to us and work with us and to develop programs of their own. I mention this because there's going to be a regional meeting, an inclusion summit, and this is for uh, Professor Reed to think about that will be taking place up in Boston and it's going to be the New England region where there will be opportunities for funding and opportunities for doing what we're doing. It's, it's coming from the National Science Foundation. It's part, part of their includes effort that they're doing and we are one of the leaders in that space because of teams like this and because of the students from many that have gone through the program. The National Science Foundation has recognized that we are a leader in, the, in this space. It's you. It's all of you. You are the leaders, and I, I'm wanting to get you all into the pipeline and continue to develop this. Let me talk about the pipeline. Next slide. So the two topics I talked about were the innovation challenge and the short course. Remember, Capital One Bank has supported us. So in addition to just having a great idea and going through training, we have resources available where we can, we can give you up to $1,000 to do that customer discovery. But that money is to go to meetings, to travel to places where the customers are, to do that customer discovery. In the short course, the amount of money, which is mainly coming straight from the National Science Foundation, that money you know, is up to $3,000, and, and that's real money. And now you can go across the country, you can go to meetings everywhere. That's what this is for. But the purpose of this is really, once you, once you go through this pipeline, there is a possibility to get up to $50,000 from the National Science Foundation. This continues going further, but I figured for this audience, I just wanted to stop here. This you can easily get, this you, you likely can get if you do research with the faculty that were on the video just before me. Right? If you have some research experience, this is appropriate. But ultimately, you can go to the $50,000. And let me go to the next slide and just show you uh, the summaries. So here's O'Meal, for those people who know. I just want to point out that this is a team 
from Queensboro. <clears throat> so Mateo and McKenna were winning the $50,000 grant. And for all the faculty members, this is Mike Lawrence at Queensboro, and it's a $50,000 NSF grant that goes to the faculty. All right, and with that, I, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over. So please participate in this program. I'll, I'll work with Professor Reed to get uh, contact information question. So it's a good question. Who gets the intellectual property rights? If the students do it, the students own it. Right? If it's done by the students, they own it, especially for the first two programs. The grant, that's the $50,000 grant that goes to the faculty member, then that would be a CUNY situation, right? because the grant is going to CUNY. But the other two, the, the innovation challenge and the short course, it's the students only. And we have many student teams that go on and develop this all by themselves. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Please join me in thanking um, Dr. John Blau. Time, time, of course, is nobody's friend in these uh, situations, but I felt like the music and the Academy Awards is coming on. So, but uh, we do thank you very much for this information. I hope that those of you who have further interest, which would be most of you, will uh, certainly have an opportunity to speak with uh, Dr. Blackwell after the uh, uh, formal proceedings. Um, we are now going to, uh, we have two presentations um, uh, to uh, go forward, three actually. Uh, the first, both of them have to do with the importance of entrepreneurship and policy. Uh, through the day we've been going through a lot of the details and very important scientific information uh, uh, as it relates to the environment and environmental concerns. Uh, what we are going to talk about, for, or what you will hear about for the balance of this afternoon, has to do with two other very important aspects. Uh, you've heard some reference to entrepreneurship and the, the tremendous opportunities uh, that are available for individuals who look at the economy, uh, excuse, look at the environment, excuse me, in terms of economic and entrepreneurial and business, um, business endeavors. So we want to hear about that. But the other aspect that we also want to hear about has to do with the importance of public policy as it relates to the environment. And you've heard this morning from governmental officials about how, how government policy impacts the, the water we, we drink, the air we breathe, and everything about uh, in, in, uh, everything in the environment in which we live. So with that, uh, as they say, uh, in, with no further ado, we have um, three presentations um, uh, by Taiwo Oyeni uh, and um, Edwin Elodimor. Elo and also Masatomo Sakiri. Uh, and I'd like to ask at this point, uh, uh, Taiwo Oyeni, who is the co-founder and lead engineer at Relay. Uh, if you could please come, you come forward together? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> please in, you know, everybody had lunch now, I know it's slowing down a little bit, but you can actually give them a real round of applause. <laughs> SMS. We started about a year and a half ago and um, have grown to where we are now and would like to share that story with you. Next slide. All right, so we're, we're immigrants, first of all, uh, from Nigeria. We moved to the state full time. Thank you. I went to Howard University for my undergraduate degree and um, studied finance. And I worked in consulting for a couple of years. It was good, but it was, you know, not what I really wanted for myself. And um, I went on to do my master's degree in economics at Johns Hopkins. And that's where we started the whole idea. You know, that's how I was talking about. All right, so I also went to Howard, um, just like Edwin said. I have a bachelor's in chemical engineering, 
and a master's in computer science. Um, so we've actually been, um, I guess, doing entrepreneurship for maybe 10 years. I took Dr. Crump's class at Howard in 2007. <laughs> um, or Micah, he always tells me to call me Micah. I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we can get into the presentation actually. Next slide, sir. Okay, so what we're really hoping to achieve today is to encourage anyone here who is thinking about doing a business to take the first step. Um, like I mentioned, we went to Howard, it's a great school. Uh, but one of the things you notice early on is students are typically set on the path to go get a job once you graduate. It's absolutely a good thing for you to do that. We did that. But we, we want to make sure that people here understand that there is a second option, which is for you to go start a business. And for us, that happened, you know, like you said, 10 years ago, but because we were international students, we didn't have the flexibility to actually do that. Visa restrictions and things like that, so we had to take regular jobs. And, you know, weekends and evenings we did brainstorming sessions, we, you know, wrote things down and then, you know, try to talk to as many people as possible about our ideas. And, and so, yeah, we, we made that conscious decision to say, you know, jobs are great, but we want more for ourselves. We want to have the freedom to control our own destiny and for us to do that. Well, the only way to do that effectively is to start a business. So I'm hoping here that we have more people who would um, graduate from school and make the decision to go start a company and hire people and you know create a lot of value in the society. All right, next slide. So uh, the second step is we made a ton of mistakes. Uh, um, we've, been, we've been doing this for about. Uh, we've been doing this for about ten years now. We've been entrepreneurs for, for that long, and in that ten year period, we've made a ton of mistakes. Um, I think one of the things that we did wrongly was we, we built products that um, weren't able to sell very quickly. Uh, first of all, we, it took us too long to build some products. And when we built products, it took us too long to get them uh, in the hands of customers. Uh, some mistakes we also made was we, uh, we tried to raise money and, and tried to get our friends to help us build a product. I didn't have a background in, in computer science. I studied chemical engineering, like I said. Um, and that, and just trying to find a friend or someone to build or trying to outsource um, to other companies, that took us maybe two years to just get past that. Um, so there were a lot of mistakes that we made on the way. Um, sometimes we built products that we thought was the minimum viable product. We thought that's the best product you could build. Uh, but by the time we got into the hands of the customer, we realized that it's not good enough. Um, so yeah, we've made a lot of mistakes in the time in the last 10 years that has kind of brought us here. Um, and my goal, our goal is that, you know, we can help people, mentor people to kind of reduce the amount of mistakes you have to make. It's part of the process, or certainly if you make the same mistakes over and over again, and that's a problem. Um, so the, that, the entrepreneurial path, it's, this is just part of it. It's just, you know, making mistakes and learning from that and then kind of growing from there. Um, it's just part of the process. Yeah, and this speaks to what uh, some speakers here already mentioned. Customer discovery is key. Uh, we've built a lot of products, you know, just on our own without really asking if the customers really wanted what we're trying to build. So we, we had at least two apps that we had to shut down. And, you know, just spend time, talk to people who you're trying to sell a product to before you build anything. I think that's the key lesson here. Next slide. Okay, so. There's a popular saying, I don't think I really know how it goes, but you're not really qualified to solve a problem you don't know enough about. And in our case, that was us not being software engineers. And what we had to do to get to that point, like you said, was for him to go back to school. Uh, keep in mind, he had a job at Goldman Sachs, and he quit to go and have a code. So it wasn't an easy decision. For me, I had to quit my job too at a consulting firm, get cash, but we decided this is what we want to do, and we had to go apply the skills for us to be able to do that. Next slide. Just to talk about the last, the last slide, 
um, you know, if you if you're trying to start a company and you do not have the skill necessary to build it or to start the company, um, it's easy. You can go on YouTube, Udemy. There are a ton of there are a ton of um, websites out there where you can learn stuff. Um, to build a company, you do not necessarily well. It depends on the kind of company. You do not necessarily need a degree or need uh, like uh, actual academic training. Um, you can learn how to write software, how to code online easily within a month or two. You can start building stuff. So I took, I left my job in 2010 at Goldman, uh, which was right after the economic downturn, and people were saying I was crazy. But I left my, I left my job. I went back to school to study how to code, and within two years I was writing software, and, and I basically had control over how we built our company. So something else that I had to do as part of the learning process, uh, software essentially lets you as a business interact with customers. And for me, I had to go work at a call center. I was probably the most qualified agent, overqualified person on the floor. But I took thousands of calls and I really learned what the process is for uh, a company who has uh, 3,000 agents, how do you really manage that interaction where you have you know, hundreds of thousands of calls coming in, how do you route it, what's the software set up like, how do you build a system that would work for these kinds of customers. So I, I took a job that paid you know, a very small sum and I had to do that because I knew there was value for me to learn. So when we say go learn, go acquire the skills, it's not necessarily you going back to college. If you know the industry you want to go work in or build a company in and there are you know, small opportunities for you to get a job in that industry, it is absolutely okay and important for you to do that. Okay. All right, so the next step we, uh, we took was we paid attention to trends. Now, we really is our maybe fifth product, I think. Uh, in the past, we, we built two other companies, one called Shoplet and the other called Rumbus. Now, Shoplet was built in 20, 2013, uh, they're about. So 2013 was when Uber, Airbnb, Lyft, all these companies were taken off. So basically crowdsourcing was taken off. And we, we thought, you know, how about books? You know, you have all these books you use right after the semester, you have to take it back to the bookstore and sell for 20 bucks. Or you have to give a friend or try to sell on Craigslist. So our goal was, you know, crowdsourcing is taken off. Why can't we allow people to you know, rent their books out to their friends? And we, we tried to build a company. We built a product. Um, selling was a, was a bit difficult. Uh, but paying attention to trends is really important. Um, the other thing is we built um, a text payment app called Rumbus um, in 2014. So in 2014, um, there was just this saturation of apps. You know, most people use maybe 20 apps, tops on their phone. Um, and building another app takes time and just takes time to get the rankings you want in the app store. So we thought, let's build um, a payment solution that uses SMS. Um, the SMS app is always on your phone. It's, you cannot delete it, you cannot do anything about it. So it gives us e easy distribution. Um, so one of the things that we have done just in the last 10 years is we always try to pay attention to trends. And um, when we built Relay, which was, uh, well, Rumbus became Relay in 2017. Um, the goal was we saw, we saw that SMS was becoming much bigger uh, within the communication space. And so we, we thought, let's add you know, message into Rumbus and then rebrand as Relay. And uh, we did that. And that's kind of led us to, you know, we, we, I think that's the title of the slide. It led us to you know, having over 20, 12 million customer interactions on our platform. So the key is to always look at the trends, things happening now. Is it on social media? Is it Instagram, Snapchat, things like that? And say, okay, how can I kind of plug into that trend um, to build a business that is sustainable? Yeah, just another point in that direction is a lot of us have really good ideas. <laughs> a lot of us have really good ideas of what we want to work on. Um, it's very important for you not to be married to your idea. As good as you think it is, it's probably not that good. And don't ask people for NDAs to share your ideas. Shout it out from the rooftop. Tell anyone who is willing to listen because you don't know where you're going to get help from. But just a little extra insight that will get you to build the right product for the right company. I think that's it. All right, so uh, since we're cutting this short, uh, we're going to have a workshop in the evening at 6 p.m. in the school. Akeem has the information on where we're going to be meeting. 
Um, the goal really is to get into more details about how we build Relay to where, it, where it's at now. Um, we're, we're just kind of going through a lot of stuff. It's 10 years of stuff in like four slides. Uh, so we want to get into more details, learn about your ideas and things you want to do and maybe give you more direct um, and instruction on those. And also tomorrow morning, we might have, I think we're going to have brunch with the team also. I came in and the other guys. So if you want to join us also, you know, we can do that and just kind of talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in giving the gentleman another round of applause. And um, I want to thank Dr. Reed for giving me the really wonderful task of cutting people off. Uh, it's my job. Uh, but we do really appreciate it. We, we have one more presentation on our entrepreneurship um, uh, topic, and that would be from Masatomo Sakaibi. Yes. Oh, here we are. Yes, but please, please come forward, please. Uh, he is the Chief Operating Officer at Pagevity. Make sure I don't go over 10 minutes. I put my stopwatch on. Um, my name is Masatomo Sakairi. Uh, my friends call me Masa. Uh, and uh, I uh, came from Japan last year on a uh, program uh, which is between the uh, NYC EBC uh, and CUNY. Uh, it's a program called Into NYC where a um, bunch of international entrepreneurs are invited to New York City to help uh, CUNY to, and its students, faculty, to be able to uh, share ideas and uh, hopefully start companies that um, will become uh, very big. So um, two things I want to do in the next uh, nine minutes is uh, one is to just uh, explain a little bit about myself because I'm a resource to all of you, including the uh, high school and middle school students. Anybody in Brooklyn, essentially, um, can uh, ask for my time. <clears throat> uh, and the other part of it is just to explain to you a little bit about um, how this happens in terms of the steps. So the next slide, please. So this is a little bit about me. Um, I'm maybe not the typical entrepreneur. I'm kind of a late bloomer. Uh, in the beginning, I started out my life in the finance world, uh, in investment banking and hedge funds and uh, private equity, uh, places like the Merrill Lynch and the Carlyle Group. Um, I, I actually made pretty good money there. Um, and I joined finance because I thought it was kind of the lifeblood of industry. And I, I learned a lot. And I, I guess I made some money as well. But I kind of got bored of it. And maybe, you know, as an entrepreneur, that's one of the things that happens to you. You kind of get bored of the status quo. Once you kind of think you learned something, you want to move to the next thing. Well, for me, it was, well, making money from money didn't seem so interesting anymore. So I wanted to do, go into industries which actually did something. And one of them was like uh, the airline business, and the other was a manufacturing company called Keto. They make uh, hoisting cranes. So I did that for seven years, actually a little bit longer if I include some of my Carlisle days where I was actually out at the company. Um, and then I really learned how things are built, what the manufacturing process is, how marketing is done, how business development is done. And then I kind of got bored of that. And then I said, look, all that stuff is some, something that's already laid out in front of you. Maybe you improve it a little, but you're not really doing something from the beginning. And so through partly the uh, NYCDC um, CUNY program, I was able to come to the United States to join a fintech company called Pageavity, where um, we uh, have something, uh, we are in a space called supply chain finance. And we essentially provide uh, cheap money for suppliers of the world um, using the credit of the buyer. And we put that on a tech platform so it's very seamless and it's very cheap. Um, and I've been doing that for a year and a half. And while I've been doing that, I've been helping out um, at Medgar Evers um, kind of in the following way. So next slide, please. 
Oh, no, six minutes. All right. <laughs> so first, you know, it starts with you and your idea. And, and to be honest with you, um, your idea may be a great idea, maybe a so-so idea. Uh, it may be an idea that maybe it doesn't start out, maybe it starts out so-so, but as you refine it, you can make it something better. Well, at Medgar Evers, and I can, I and, and a few other entrepreneurs like myself can help you guide, guide you through the thought process of thinking, make, uh, understanding if it makes sense or not. Now, there's various issues, and, and today we had some you know, very good speakers talking about what things you have to think about, uh, including uh, customer discovery, or thinking through the business model, or thinking through the actual demands or needs of the market. So we also can help you do that. And then once we've kind of pushed back on you a little bit maybe, because you know we want to make sure, we, we don't want to just say, hey, your idea is great, and kind of watch you fail. We want to make sure you succeed. And to do that, we may ask hard questions, uh, we may be a little bit tough on you, it may take some time, but we will try to um, kind of guide you through the, the, the deep process of uh, being a startup. And part of what we will do after that is to kind of uh, introduce you and get you involved in, these are some just examples, and I will give you even more detailed examples on the next slide, but for example, pitch competitions, accelerators that could give you uh, both some seed money and network and I guess iCorp is one, one of these um, and also sometimes your idea will need some legal advice and certainly if you're going to set up a company you might also want some legal advice and then it kind of goes from there to even talking to end users uh, uh, need, you may need some engineering needs if you're going to have a prototype um, also, there's consultants in various areas, and we will, and also venture capital, which has lots of money. So we will, um, as I guess, um, you know, I was looking at iCorp's presentation today, and I was thinking, hey, that, that's a great resource, and I have heard of you. I should have known more about you, but uh, please forgive me. I've only been on the scene for six months, so maybe we should talk. But anyways. Um, we will try to guide you and help you in that direction. And then if you look on the next page, so here, here we have uh, Medgar Evers, uh, professors and on supporting entrepreneurs like myself. And then there's like pitch competitions. I don't know if you know CUNY startups, but they're, they're one of the places that um, have a, a competition that you can get exposure. Um, other colleges that I just happen to know of is like Smith and Tulane. Of course, there's lots and lots of colleges that have pitch competitions um, and also incubators. So there's like the Techstars, uh, Entrepreneur Roundtable uh, Association um, or uh, Y Combinator. There are different places that can um, help you um, to kind of move to the next step. And I also kind of mentioned some law firms that are also in the startup phase. So in the last slide, I think it's the last slide, yes. So there's an actual case that I just wanted to really um, run through with you because I think it's, it will give you a concrete example of what can happen, which is, um, uh, and, and I just got uh, okay from her to say her name. <laughs> She's Jessica David, she's a, a senior, a majoring in psychology. I met her through, through Professor Crump. Professor Crump uh, introduced me to her. And since then, uh, she, and she has a uh, uh, invention which is adding uh, extensions. It's a device that adds extensions uh, for women primarily. Um, uh, in a very expedient way. And so she had already filed for what's called a provisional patent back in October, so I didn't help her in any of that, but she essentially came to me right after that. And since then, in the last how many months since November, maybe five months, 
we, we went through all these different things, um, and these are just kind of the summary. Um, so for example, we're trying to figure out what the actual market size of her product could be, or uh, what the value proposition is. So how much faster could it be, or how much cheaper could it be? Could it be, is it cheaper for the end user? Is it cheaper for the salon to use it? All, all this analysis. We also talked to different attorneys because their original attorney didn't seem maybe so good. So we got like three other attorneys involved to get different estimates from them. We drafted a founder's agreement. We did um, customer discovery surveys. We're still not done with that, but we've started that. Um, and then all the way to um, a couple weeks ago, we went up to Cornell to talk to an engineer who um, is thinking about putting together a prototype for us. And last but not least, uh, we entered into a competition with uh, the Smith College, uh, the Draper competition, and we were uh, accepted as a semi-finalist. So uh, next month, I guess in a few few weeks, uh, we will be going over there and pitching. <laughs> yes, so things are going very well. So, um, and, and I guess the next slide, just my, my contact information. It's pretty easy, masstumbo.sakari at gmail.com. If you um, want, you can be any stage of your idea. I'd be happy to brainstorm and I'd be happy to uh, introduce you or refer you to these different resources that I mentioned. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please another round of applause. Yes, we just have to do it. Um, I, I want to thank. Is Dr. Skeet still here? He's not here. I guess I'll, I'll thank Dr. Reed as well for. Uh, having me come up with no introduction whatsoever. Uh, so actually I'm with NYPD and I'm in charge of security. And, yeah, yes. And so I wanted to thank um, also Dr. Reed for not letting the string show as she just has been. My name is Professor Wallace Ford. I am uh, a member of the faculty of the Department of Public Administration, which is responsible for the policy portion of uh, this um, today's activities. So we are going to, uh, just so we kind of have the run of show here, and we're going to get started. Um, we are um, going to have a, a initial presentation uh, by uh, Ms. Raya S S Salter. Ms. Salter is, and uh, as you see, you see in your program as well, she's an attorney, consultant, educator, and clean energy law and policy expert. Um, uh, she, is, um, she works on energy law and regulation in multiple jurisdictions, including Hawaii, although she now lives here in New York, and you can ask her why she left Hawaii to come to New York. Uh, but uh, I'm sure it's for a good, good worthy cause. But uh, it, is, it is important, and why, as I mentioned earlier, and what we will be speaking about today, uh, after her presentation, we have two other members of the faculty of the Department of Public Administration to join her in a brief and robust discussion with questions and answers about the um, whole notion of the relationship between any concerns that any of us have with respect to the environment and the law and, and uh, public policy. Um, you will hear about what has happened over the last two, two and a half years uh, under the administration of uh, President Trump, or, or as, as I call him, he whose name shall not be spoken. Um, but uh, we will uh, indeed uh, want, want to know, we all need to know, if we're going to be knowledgeable about these matters, uh, the relationship between law, policy, and government and the environment all the environmental issues we've heard about through the day. So with that, as I said, I will now, um, it is now my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Micah Crump because he won't get off the stage, so we have to. <laughs> we only need three, we only need three. We only need three. Only need three. So I had a band when I was in law school and I uh, used to sing songs, and I think this is the part where I'm supposed to sing a song to just kind of Keep things going. Is it to go? Okay, it's not fine. <laughs> it's been a long day for everyone. Right? Okay, um, and, and speaking of long days, um, before we ask um, Ms. Salter to come up, please give yourselves a round of applause for sticking through this entire day. A lot of hard work went into it, but nothing happens without you. So we want to all thank you very much. 
And um, at this point, uh, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce and please join me in welcoming Ms. Raya Salter. Hello, everybody. I am so pleased to be here to speak with you today. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you, Dr. Ford. And I'll reiterate, reiterate thanks to everyone because it is hard to stay for the entire program. So it's great to have your support as we close out the day. So I just wanted to speak to you briefly. You know, as Dr. Ford said, the Trump administration has had a lot of regressive environmental policies across the board, from energy to environmental health and safety. However, throughout these dark, dark times, um, the states have really been doing a lot of progressive work um, on clean energy and environmental policy. And there really is a lot happening right now in New York State that could, I think, really impact your entrepreneurial opportunities. There's going to be investment in the clean energy economy, clean energy jobs, um, and, and water infrastructure. So I thought that I would just give a backdrop on some of that. And I suspect I've been just really excited to see the various professors and resources that you have here at Medgar Evers. And I'm sure that the folks that I've been hearing from are very connected you know, to Brookhaven and others who are directly involved in where some of these programs are going to be ramping up. So go ahead, we'll, we'll go ahead to the next slide, please. Just a little bit about me. It's in the program already. Dr. Ford mentioned it. Um, I'm an attorney. Uh, clean energy advocate. I also do community outreach. I will mention, I was talking to Dr. Ford over lunch. I don't know, it's, especially when you're a younger student, graduate school can see really far away. I mean, do we have parents in the audience? Parents? Yeah, so I'll just say that, you know, it's something I don't usually share, but when I was in law school, I was a single mother. My daughter was three years old. I was able to do it, so if that's something that you would like to do, I'm sure that this is something that you could do as well. So next slide, please. Oh yeah, professors, please, if you're interested in energy justice or energy related issues, please get my book and use it in your classes. Thank you. All right, <laughs> get it on Amazon. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so really, in my mind, this is all about you because there's a, a, a young woman who I think maybe some of you guys have heard of, right? who, as part of really a youth agenda, has brought forward something on the federal level that's being referred to as the Green New Deal. So who here has heard of the Green New Deal? Just about every single person, right? This is about you guys. This was about the youth agenda. This was a young woman and her supporters from New York who came forward and put this on the agenda um, in, a, in a big way. So this is really about you, it's about your future, it's about the young people. So next slide, please. So what happened, I mean, look, this is my take on the politics, you know, so you can take that with a grain of salt. But I think in New York, Governor Cuomo decided this is a party I wanna join. And so he came forward this year in his budget with what he is calling New York's Green New Deal. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna read everything on this slide, but what is in the budget this year in New York is one and a half billion in competitive awards for large scale renewables, 2.5 billion for clean water infrastructure, um, just big, big numbers in these areas and more. And this money is gonna go towards research, it's gonna go towards infrastructure development, and I say, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, later in terms of like what will actually come out of this, but this is on the table this year. Uh, and also, uh, Governor Cuomo has brought forward the idea of the most progressive renewable energy goal in the entire country, bigger than Hawaii, which has 100% renewable energy by 2045. Uh, next slide, please. Sounds great. You know, Cuomo, wow, he's so progressive. Next slide, please. But hold on a minute, a little something happened in November, I think people here know about, and that we have a, we used to have a 
split control of the legislature, and now we have Democratic control with Ms. Stewart Cousins and Mr. Hasty. And it just so happens, if you go to the next slide, that three years ago, the Assembly passed a Climate and Community Protection Act. Now, the Climate and Community Protection Act and Cuomo's Green New Deal have a lot of good things in common, and I'm really behind and here for many of them. But I think that it's important to really, uh, the few things that I'll point out is that the CCPA has things that are really pointed at uh, redistributing, some, redistributing some of the benefits from the energy sector. So it specifically says 40% of the current money that's used for clean energy in certain programs should instead be diverted specifically to go to um, vulnerable communities, environmental justice communities in New York to help increase uh, resilience um, and, and help communities prepare for extreme weather and help people in New York get, um, get better jobs. In fact, the CCPA requires that there be a prevailing wage for uh, jobs that are created with these funds. So while there's a lot of good things in both bills, uh, I think that from a, what, what I would call an energy justice perspective, there's more goodies in the CCPA, and they already passed it. They weren't able to get it through the Republican, you know, they had dual control. But now, things are different. Next slide, please. So really, we'll see what happens. Um, what tends to happen, and next slide, please, is that the arms of government, the uh, the House and the Assembly and the governor, the executive branch, have to come together and work out exactly how all these projects are going to play out. But the reason that I think it's important to talk about is because when the executive puts it in their budget, that means that there's money earmarked for some big things to happen. So we're going to see what they ultimately hash out. But I think it's going to mean um, some new directions and some funds coming, hopefully, to the way, you know to the direction of institutions like this um, and other things that um, you know that we should all stay aware of. And we'll see how it plays out. Oh, last slide, real quick. Buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. When we said we were promoting entrepreneurship, we weren't kidding. <laughs> Please join in thanking uh, Ms. Salter again, Ms. Mariah Salter. And uh, we're going to begin the next part of our program. Uh, uh, we have with us, as I said, two members of the faculty of the Department of Public Administration. Uh, we have uh, Professor Gregorio Mayers. Please, for those of you who don't know Professor Mayers, both of you, uh, uh, Professor Mayers is, is an alumnus of Medgar Evers College, by the way, and uh, he brings a tremendous governmental experience, having been a senior advisor to Mayor Blumberg uh, during the Blumberg administration and having served as the head of the Environmental Control Board, amongst other um, responsibilities that he had. Uh, and um, we'll speak to that in just a moment. Also joining us is Dr. John Flateau. Yes, uh, Dr. Flateau is the chair of the Department of Public Administration. Uh, during the administration of David Dinkins, he was Mayor Dinkins' chief of staff. Uh, he has, as I said, uh, served both as a dean and now as chair of the Department of Public Administration and brings, again, a wealth of experience in the areas that we're talking about, the connection of policy and government and law to the environment. So as uh, I think uh, Chris Cuomo says, let's get to it, right? So we're just going to, I don't think I need to do a lot of in, uh, moderating here at the moment. Uh, Professor Mayers, why don't we ask if you would begin uh, just, um, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Plateau, I believe you have a, a brief um, uh, PowerPoint that you're going to re reference. Or, well, we'll I go in that order. Well, we'll go in that order. Okay, yes, we'll just, we'll, why don't we, we have that PowerPoint. It's the, uh, it's the speed version of it, and uh, we'll get Speed version. Forward. There we go. Thank okay, you. thanks. Good. Thank you. See, we're, we're on speed dial, folks, so pay attention. That's a long title. Um, very recently, just about a week ago, Medgar held a, a major summit on gentrification. And what I'm attempting to do here is to intersect this whole question of home ownership, land ownership, with 
the built environment. There's all types of environmental issues. And if we don't hold on to the land and buildings, the homes, the businesses that we have, you're gonna have a lot smaller customer base to do everything else that you may be dreaming about as entrepreneurs. Next. That was the conference that was held. Churches. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the Caribbean Research Center and their uh, visionary leader, Dr. George Irish, who recently transitioned. Does anybody, does that name ring a bell? Let's give him a round of applause. He did a, he led a multi-year study fun funded by Carnegie looking at our Caribbean American neighborhoods uh, throughout the city. And one of those items was looking at churches because they are major landowners and buildings in our community assets. And we found that uh, just in our local zip codes, not even all of Brooklyn, there are over 600 church institutions that's building and land. And a lot of the work that you're talking about in terms of uh, some of the commercialization of our environmental research could impact very positively. These could be the customer bases. Our churches, our faith institutions, and our homeowners, which I'm gonna very quickly move to now. Next, that happened to be my church in that slide, by the way. Okay, so citywide, on the far left, there are over a million homeowners in Brook throughout New York City, over one million. Next. There's an anomaly though, if you look on the right, there's a locust plague of mortgage foreclosures throughout the entire city. And the darker the area, the bigger the problem. So you're looking at almost the entire Bronx, a whole swath across central Brooklyn, including where we're sitting right now, and southeast Queens. Next. Those are patterns, trends in home ownership throughout the five boroughs in New York City over the last uh, almost 15 years. The table on the right gives us a breakdown. So Queens has the largest homeowner group in the entire city of that million, closely followed by Brooklyn. If you look at it racially, there are half a million white homeowners throughout the city. The sec Second largest group is 200,000 black homeowners. Three quarters of them are right here in central Brooklyn and in southeast Queens. Next slide. Again, the problem side. Um, look at number one on the right. 11236. Anybody live in 1123? Oh, here we go. Canarsie Flatlands is one of the epicenters of the foreclosure crisis. And look at those neighborhoods, Springfield Gardens, St. Albans. These are top 10 in the entire state having this problem. Next slide. Home ownership in Brooklyn. Next slide. Next slide. Here we go again. Canarsie, Flatlands are at the top of this top 10 list. Springfield Gardens. St. Albans, Hempstead, places, Rochdale, where we live. Next. This is a, so this is that 11236. We're talking about Flatbush Avenue on the south, Linden Boulevard, streets that are familiar to us. So that whole section, Canarsie Flatland, south of Linden Boulevard, this is where the big problem is. One, one, two, three, six. We're losing, we're hemorrhaging our home ownership assets. Next. Queens, next. Next. So, zeroing in is one thing to say, borrow Queens. AD stands for what? Public PA majors? Assembly district. So this is one assembly district. There are 60 of them in the entire city. And in less, look at the years, 2009 to 16. So in less than 10 years, over 2,000 black homeowners have disappeared in that one small district. And there are others like it. Next slide. You can look at it in terms of congressional districts too. 
Three of the 14 congressional districts in New York City have over 80% of all the homeowners. They're in Congressman Jeffrey's district, uh, which we're looking at here, and next, next. Congresswoman Clark's district. These are the two in Brooklyn. Next, next. And the one in Queens. So Congress members Clark, Jeffries, and Meeks have over 80% of all black homeowners in New York City are in just those three congressional districts. We could drill this down in any way that you want it. State Senate, Assembly District, and when I say we, also affiliated with the Department of Public Admin is the Du Bois Barnes Center for Public Policy, and we're within the uh, School of Business. And let's give a shout out to our Dean Joanne Rowe, who's down here in the front row with us. Next, next. A new, a new program, here comes our governor again. <laughs> he announced right in this auditorium a, a year ago in March, literally just 12 months ago in this very room, a program called Vital Brooklyn. And what is Vital Brooklyn? Next. It's an eight point program. Half of, half of $1.4 billion is gonna go to transform healthcare delivery throughout Central Brooklyn. But there is also a very large uh, funding, if you look at number seven down there, for affordable housing, almost 600 million in affordable housing. Thousands of new units being built uh, are going to be, are in the process of being built throughout Central Brooklyn. But we need to hold on to what we have as well. New York City, next slide, I'm not even gonna go into detail, also has uh, a major affordable housing program. But we should not be distracted to the new <laughs> programs coming online when we're losing our homes uh, and our churches right out from under us at the same time. We're almost done. Um, related, the Census 2020 is upon us. That's a once in every 10 year count of all people in the United States and it's used to distribute money, power, and our constitutional rights. Money, over $800 billion a year from the federal budget is allocated using census data driven formulas. 800 billion a year times 10 years, that's $8 trillion. We have a, a major undercount problem in communities of color. We're always getting undercounted. So we're not getting our fair share of that $800 billion a year as a result. So that's another project that we collectively need to focus on. The, those Census formulas are also driving funding for education, for scientific research, for tr mass transit, public safety, et cetera. So that's, that's another project upon us. We're almost done here. Uh, it's already projected. Look, at the, that's a map of what? United States, right? You see what color New York is. New York State is red. They're already projecting we're gonna lose two congressional seats due to the undercount, our traditional undercount here. So we have to turn these, these things around. We'll lose money, we'll lose political representation, then we won't have the voices making decisions about environmental justice, education, healthcare, et cetera. Next. That is it. That's, a, that's an eight point program, we won't go into detail. Maybe we can get some of those issues out, or recommendations out on the table um, during the question and answer. Next slide. Next. Voila. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Flatto. Uh, at this point, I'd like one of these should work, right? <laughs> so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Plateau, Professor Mayers, if you please uh, continue, and um, then uh, Ms. Salter, uh, you'll be up next. Thank you. Thank you, uh, colleague uh, Ford, and um, good afternoon, colleagues. Good to see you and students.
community members. Um, it's been a long day, it's been stated earlier, so I'm not gonna take a lot of your time. There's no PowerPoint presentation of my end. Um, just really wanna get you into the conversation around um, three legislation. Um, as Ford, President Ford indicated, uh, we teach law and policy. Um, uh, three of us apply to a PhD, you know, uh, Ms. Salter as well as an attorney. So we look at the public policy and the legal aspect of how do you address these issues, these environmental justice issues, which you saw from some of our presentation, and Flato looked at some of the policy um, uh, concerns with both demographics and in terms of loss of homeowners issues and a myriad of impacts that really dovetail right into environmental issues. Um, I wanted to just ask a quick random question. How many of you here are familiar with the actual physical location um, where the site building is adjacent outside of the parking lot. What facility was housed there? You know, raise your hand. The current new science technology building. Yes, maybe two. Sanitation, there was a sanitation garage. The sanitation garage, right. Thank you. How many anybody knows how many what year was that? I mean, if you know close. Uh, See, he's mostly close, yeah. So that was put there in, when we talk about environmental uh, justice, that garage and part of that uh, policy was put there in the late 1969-70 in terms of where we should house it. Now how many of you also knew that that sanitation garage, it was really the depot, so we would have maggots. When I was a student, you had rats running back and forth, the stench, it was really, Stink, you could eat your lunch, fast by, close by. So Tony came taking the photos, knows that, because he was part of this movement as well. Professor Ski came later on of that. So, um, lo and behold, and I'm getting to the point of environmental justice, and Flato, you're familiar with that. That station, they collected garbage in Midwood, Brooklyn. Not here. So the, 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 the station was not servicing this community. There were garbages from other parts of other the district that was housed here. When I got to City Hall, I tried to figure out when I was working to try to get the funds for the science building, how did that happen and how did it get there? And they said, well, part of the community board meetings, part of the community engagement, many of us were sleeping at the wheel, Dean, so we didn't show up <laughs> at the meetings. So really, so that was put from that neighborhood over in our neighborhood because they didn't want it in their neighborhood, okay? I'm getting to my point of environmental justice, environmental racism, and not only that, but putting it on the side of us as residents, as voters, right, to be educated, to be informed, to be proactive, and to be vigilant, right, among those policy and social issues that you could channel your energy and resources there to fight it. So, I, I thought that was a perfect opening to look at environmental racism, environmental justice, because it, it occurred right here. For many years, we went through that stench, that smell, not only us as students, but members of the neighborhood, of the community, children, the schools, back and forth. So gradually, it took a lot for us to move and get it back to the other neighborhood. And Flancho, I'm sure you remember the politics. We had to pay. Yes, the, the other neighbor said, well, it's gonna cost negotiation because we don't want it anymore in our neighborhood. So we have to do some harsh trading and millions of dollars and funds back in your neighborhood to get it back where it belongs. <laughs> so that's how we were able then to get this new building, this new science and technology building up and running. But again, see, thank you, yes. <laughs> but if we were not, if we were proactive as a community, as a group, that would not have happened. So I'm saying that to young folks here that, again, all politics are local. And Flato, you know who, who's a former speaker that made that, that statement, which was who? Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill, right? All politics are local. So you have 59 community boards here. We have community board eight and nine here. Um, each of those boards have an environmental right, uh, committee, right, where they have a housing committee. So once in a while, students here at Mega Rappers, or if you live in the community, even if you can't attend the meetings, you should look. You should look at the monthly meeting and see what's on the agenda. What are some of the topical issues that are coming to your community board? 
And you should know that not even a liquor store, not even a new development can just walk into your neighborhood unless what? They come through the community board. But you have to be there, your voice has to be there, you have to be able to voice your concerns, you have to talk to your elected officials about it. So, um, so I urge you to be involved and do that. Um, I wanted to talk about three city council. Um, my colleagues spoke a lot on the state side, and like both of them spoke about the state and some, some federal. I wanted to just bring your attention to three uh, uh, legislation. One, on the city council passed originally first in 2005 by uh, city council member Charles Barron and then reintroduced again by his wife Inez, is Intro Environmental Justice Plan 8868. So I want you to look that up, those who are public administration student. Um, this, this, it, it looks at environmental justice and it means that fear, of it, fear and, and equal treatment involved of all persons regardless of race and color. It forces the city council and the agencies in the city when their policy decision on builders, right, commercial builders and developers that are coming into the city to develop that they take concerns on the impact that it will have on our community. Lastly, the law affirms that no group shall bear a disproportionate share of negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, municipal, and commercial operations and execution of federal, state, or local programs. So here you have the local government are saying, even if the federal government, the EPA, is looking to put a, 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 a building or have a, build, uh, a, a business that will generate a certain amount of you know, carbon or impact upon our neighborhood, this legislation on a local level will say, hold up, wait a minute, right? And you have the other environmental justice groups who will come to the aid. Next uh, is Local Law 152. Um, this was signed in August of last year. It was created to reduce the amount of waste that can be taken to a transfer station, right, in four neighborhoods that bear the brunt of the city's waste management infrastructure, right? So, so four neighborhoods, right? Um, <laughs> this follows a lot in terms of what uh, my colleagues spoke about those neighborhoods. Because of course, Brooklyn and the Bronx, certainly, uh, you know, and Manhattan are some of those neighborhoods. So again, what this does, it, 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 it reduces, right, that can be taken to a transfer station of four of those, those neighborhoods. And that is critical because Brooklyn certainly is, is, is one of those. Now, um, the percentage of those stations, how many of you think, what percentage of those transfer stations do you think that we have here? So uh, total total waste transfer station, anyone know the total, uh, maybe you want to take a guess, the total trans waste transfer station we have in this five boroughs? Any environmental faculty members here? I mean, think, give it a shot. Okay, 38. 38. How many, how many of those stations do you think that um, uh, that we have here um, in this in, 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 in this borough? Let's look at South, the Bronx, Queens. We have a total, uh, in the city there are 38, we, we have about 26, right? Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's staggering, right? So to make matters worse, uh, the, the, the current system, it just it overburdens the amount. So the law look at limiting the impact of, uh, of how many of these stations and going forward can be in our neighborhood. Uh, to make matters worse, it says under the current system, these overburdened communities have permitted capacity to accept even more than they already do. So it had to stop. And clearly, I don't have to tell you about the health issues with asthma, right, and all many other issues that impact our children in K-12 uh, in the system when they don't know what impacts them. Not only living in the public housing system uh, alone, um, it is because they're surrounded. And you may recall several years ago where uh, Environmental Justice Group had to sue the, F the FTA, the bus depot in Harlem, right? right? Because in that catchment area, so many kids, regardless of what color you were, had asthma and had respiratory issues and conditions. So um, again, um, this, this bill um, uh, is called the Waste Equity Legislation, um, addresses these issues. So again, you know, in wrapping up, um, we have to be vigilant um, Plato said earlier, you know what AD means. 
So you should know also what CD means, your councilmanic district, right? You should also know that your co congressional district and your SD, your senatorial district. But one of the things that Dr. Blair, who's not, not here, always does in her class, and I do it now in our intro to PA 103, is to have you write a letter to your elected official. No student should be here not knowing who represents them at the local, state, or federal level. You should know that, you should be able to see and, and, and what committees they sit on. And lastly, I, I urge you, um, if you live in a community board that is um, one of those that listed up here, this is eight and nine, there's a book that is published yearly called um, The Needs, The District Needs. What are the district needs of the community? And it takes it in the area of youth, the housing, development, seniors. It lets you know the data and what we need. So look at environmental issues, look at some of the concerns, write letters to your city council members. So again, these three legislation that were introduced in the city council came from advocates, it came from students, it came from a coalition, a group of people, because again, in closing, uh, policy and legislation, you can protest is good, you can say rah, 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 246, hey, who we don't want in here, you know? And that's good, and you go home and feel good. The waste transfer station is still there. <laughs> right, please. So policy and legislation by your city council members, these three that I just put forth here, and there are more in the pipeline. So um, I want you to take notes of those three and um, push for more legislation to curtail the amount of waste transfer station and the environmental quality of life issues that impact us here in this city. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Mayers. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Salter if you'd like to add some additional comments. Um, and just prior to doing so, let me point out that we have two microphones, one here and one on the other side of the, um, the, the aisle here. And uh, we'd like to uh, dedicate a few moments, uh, more than a, uh, some time, uh, for some questions and, and answers and comments that you might have. This is supposed to be interactive at the end of the day, of course. So uh, if you have a question or comment, you can please come forward. You'll be recognized. In the meantime, Ms. Salt, if you'd like to comment on what you've heard so far, and then we're going to uh, move into our interactive mode. Thank you. I, I guess I've, um, I really, it's almost, I have like a, a question for both of you, and, it, and maybe for everybody here, because we've got, on the state level, A, we've got these environmental justice initiatives, people, a lot of groups have been pushing for this for a long time, you, you yourself, and, and you also are aware of these issues and have worked on them for a long time. Um, and we, now we have at the state level, you know, they're pushing now, they've been pushing for a long time for, to codify more of these environmental justice principles into law that will actually give communities more of a voice in the process so it doesn't have to rely on, you know, people having to jump up from their day to day. Yet, you know, why, why has it been so difficult to make some of this happen and what do we got to do to see some of this pushed over the edge. And, and of course, including the fact that the justice principles of Green New Deals are supposed to help things like the home ownership issue, which was very compelling, and I wasn't aware of the extent um, to which it was a problem in this area in particular. I think, I think one, one, one aspect of it is education. We're an institution of higher learning. I've had, for instance, my city council person and my, uh, actually my assembly person, on certain legislation would say to me, what is your opinion or what's your thought? This is why an institution like Medgar, the School of Science and Technology, the Environmental Science Department, is, is a good think tank resource. And a lot of time, when these matters come up in session on the legislative front, many of our elected officials may not be familiar with it. They may not be able to uh, put forth a white paper to address it. They may have to turn to some other institutions or organization. So the more awareness, the more education and institution, such as Medgar Evers and Brooklyn College and many of the other schools who have such programs and science programs, our faculty are expert, subject matter experts. I think that relationship, I think it, 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 you're right. It will start to be codified and make it easier that you wouldn't have to have this burden and give the community members a voice. But also to, I think, um, next year, we should have many, the members of the Environmental Committee in Albany and City Council here as well. And I think they want to hear from us. Mm -hmm. So I think that partnership, that built-in uh, relationship, 
helps them and strengthens them more that when the matter comes before them in meeting with the governor, in meeting with on the federal level, uh, on, on the EPA and DEP, they are they are informed and able to talk more about it and perhaps even get help from us in terms of crafting legislation. Solid waste management is big business, multi-billion, just think about it. There's nine million of us in New York City. And think about all the waste we dispose of. It's big business to package it, burn it, ship it out of here. So there are forces in commerce and industry that's why the work that you're doing here as faculty is very important. You, if you, you're on the cutting edge of potentially creating new technologies, and, and what we're up against is the, is the holders of the old technologies that are making money right now. And if they could see the light that there are new technologies coming on the scene, new ways, better ways to literally handle our business, Double entendre intended. <laughs> then, then we we could we I think we could move forward uh, more progressively. But it's going to take. First of all, it takes invention, and we and scientists. There's an important marriage going on here with that's being pushed. The commercialization of your research is very important. Okay, to get it into the civilian sector, into the business sector. And then that's going to create new ways of, of, of living for us. We're going to run out of space with the old ways of disposing of God. How many more uh, uh, acres is Pennsylvania going to let us d dump our, our, our waste from New York City? We can't put it in the ocean anymore. So new technology, science and research, and, and pushing commercially in new directions. Entrepreneurs think of new ways. I brought up that million homeowners because that's potentially a million uh, uh, roof solar panel installations that could be done. That's uh, potentially one or two million new toilets that waste less water when we flush them. Uh, that's new lighting that, that uh, uses less uh, uh, electrical current. That's, that's the commercial base. That's why I wanted to bring up the, 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 the housing and homeowner issue, but I think those are some of the reasons. Mm -hmm. okay, thank, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Dean Roll, and before you ask your question, I'll give you the microphone. Uh, I have a, a class, one of, students from one of my classes, a PA 260 class here, and if we don't get at least two questions from the PA 260 students, that extra credit we talked about, <laughs> now, why don't you show me how smart you really are? I told you to keep those receipts. This question, this question is to Professor Flateau, anyone else who can answer it. Uh, the gentrification in Brooklyn primarily is being driven by high demand economics. What can be done? I mean, the, what is driving folks out is the property that happens. The value of the property and the tax base. So, how are we to help stop the eroding of, you know, black ownership? Actually, there's a, uh, I believe it's this week or next week, there's going to be a major uh, public hearing at Borough Hall with the uh, members of the state legislature. There are a number of things that can be done. One of the things that happened after the, uh, the housing crash, so-called crash, right? We didn't crash, Wall Street crashed, and they landed on us. They, they, they tightened up um, the requirements for getting homeowner loans. Um, and we have a lot of our folks who didn't read the fine print when they signed up for mortgages 10 and 15 years ago, and we're seeing the aftermath of that now, balloon payments. Some of those loans could be renegotiated, but there's not enough. We, gotta, we have to bring our financial institutions to the table. They were all bailed out. They're all healthy now. Other than Lehman Brothers, they're the only ones that went down. Everybody else 
is up and running and doing very well right now in the financial sector. Meanwhile, they're holding the paper on the mortgages that we're losing our homes out from under us. So there needs to be more advocacy, more pressure, and I think our legislators are realizing that homeowners are voters. There's a correlation between owning a home, do you have a huge stake in your community when you own, when you have a mortgage. Renters, we can come and go. Some of us try to go before we even pay the homeowner, <laughs> you know? But homeowners have a huge stake, and our legislators, that's why I put that one district up there. If you lose two or three, that's two or three thousand, or double that number of votes disappearing out of your political base, somebody else can come. That could be the handwriting on the wall for you to not be there in another year or two. So policy uh, changes, we need more cooperation, I think, from the, from the uh, financial sector. We need more educated consumers so that we don't sign on the dotted line for, for transactions that, that we're not ready to handle. And some of our folks need help. A lot of the homeowners that are being taken advantage of are seniors. They've been in those buildings now for 20, 30, 40 years. You know, now you're getting bombarded with, with mail notices. Um, and, and if you're not following through and you don't have a, a support system that literally checking your mail or providing you guidance, or, oh, you're one month behind on your water bill, or, or, or the, you paid off your mortgage, so now you have to pay your property tax. You know, if, if that kind of follow-up isn't happening, then, or that's the kind of follow-up, I think, that could help us sustain uh, our, our real estate homeowner base in our community. Okay, we have a couple of students who are coming forward. Uh, your clock is ticking a bit. While they're coming forward, uh, let me just ask a question of the panel. Uh, one of the things that we definitely want to make sure our audience is aware of is the changes that have taken place with respect to environmental policy, at, particularly at the federal level, uh, over the last two years. And uh, what impact do we see, do you see, or can we uh, reasonably expect in the near future as a result? And as jump ball, whoever would like to uh, take that. It's 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 so bad that it's it's worse, I think, than really. You know, it's a, it's a truly it's a worst case scenario um, because it, it really is. I mean, from the energy perspective, the, the fossil fuel industry has moved in literally to our our federal levers of power and and taken over in their own interest. So not only did we see the ending of the Obama era clean power plan, which was the uh, which was the mechanism that the Obama administration sought to employ in the states to reduce greenhouse gases and really was the mechanism that allowed him to go to Paris um, and make that uh, landmark climate agreement. America has a way to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So not only were pro programs like that completely shuttered, but, and I'll just speak for another second on the energy situation, because it's bad across the board. But uh, President Trump has been promoting energy sources like coal that are no longer economic. So he's actually saying, at greater cost, we want to continue, uh, we want to, let's keep open coal plants that aren't making money, when it would actually be cheaper to shut them down and have alternative fuel. So it, it's, it's, it's really, really bad. I was going to say something very similar that the current administration is reversing uh, uh, the policy of the previous administration about moving to alternative fuels, solar, wind, uh, water, uh, and, and literally, I, I think there was an announcement of, of a coal executive, I think he just announced a coal executive at the it literally, the U.S. Also industry, yes, so. has literally been moved into power to literally go in, roll back. I'm sorry, I get, I get very upset because it's very, it's, it's actually depressing because they want to roll back things that are no-brainers, things that you know, if we have 
the, the clean air regulations, that means that thousands and thousands of less people die from pollutants in the air. Rolling them back, and, and some of it almost seems to be just with joyful abandon. You know, it's, it's some of the wildlife protections, the things that are being rolled, rolled back for, for wildlife almost just seem cruel and unnecessary. Like it, you know, it's, it's really, there, I'm gonna, there are some real yahoos that have been put in charge of not only our energy policy, but protecting our, our natural resources, our wildlife, it's, it's really bad. Um, we have, uh, you wanna introduce yourself, please. Uh, that's one out of two, by the way, uh, PA260 class, so yes. <laughs> Um, so at the beginning, Chairman talked about Chairman Plateau talked about uh, gentrification. My question is, is um, for people who are can't get into higher uh, education for college and stuff, what's a way they can learn about gentrification and help people that are going through gentrification at this time? There are um, again, I believe, certainly state and local government levels are now very cognizant of the issue and the problem. Um, there were a lot of town hall meetings, as, as Professor Mayers mentioned, there are a lot of meetings being called throughout our communities now to, to confront this issue. And it's actually been found that in some cases, state and local government has been part of the problem. There have been, for example, there's a city program right now called Third Party Transfer that comes out of uh, New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. And it looks like uh, some of our, our older homeowners got caught in that, in that bureaucratic maze where they, didn't, they weren't even aware that their homes were being transferred uh, out from under them because they were maybe uh, slightly behind in payment of property taxes or water taxes water and sewer tax. There are a lot of advocacy and community groups out here uh, that are mobilizing on this issue also. So the bottom line is, you're absolutely right. You don't have to be a student here at Medgar Evers College, as Professor mentioned. Know who your legislators are. Either they're on top of the issue and you need to get on board with them, or they're not on board with the issue and you need to show up <laughs> in their office or whenever they're calling a meeting and begin raising issues like that. My, my councilman, what are you doing about this issue or that problem? Gentrification, uh, higher rents, uh, displacement uh, of tenants, using um, illegal tactics to displace tenants or move them out of their, their apartments. So there's a lot of activity that can go, out, go around for community, college students, and, and our academic missions as well. Thank you very much, appreciate it. We've got time for uh, one, two more questions. One more question. We have, one more, we have a student right here. So please, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Janai Jeter. Um, my question was- I'm sorry, you, what, your name is? Janai Jeter. Thank you. Janai <laughs> Jeter. Um, my question was in regards to the new initiative of affordable housing. Um, it seems like a pro for many people who have currently been facing financial hardships and pain. But how do we kind of get more on the road of rent stabilization and home ownership stabilization over forcing these people out and giving them the second option as a helping them to stay where they are and making living more affordable for them instead of pushing them to a side. Let me just thank you for your question. Um, the first thing is to look from it from a policy perspective. If you were to travel to Europe, uh, uh, any other country in the world, and you see what they do for housing, uh, we don't do that. So there are three types of, 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 of home ownership, right, or at least from a habit of perspective where you live in your abode. One, you privately own your home, right? Condo, whatever, or, or channel that you have. 
uh, two, you're one of those one million apartments in the city that are rent stabilized or rent controlled, rent controlled, meaning before 1969 for those apartments, right? Um, and those are subsidy because the landlord gets, if you pay 1500 it's really 2500 or 2000 It's a subsidy from the legislative branch that give that, you know, that program to afford because we don't build from a federal policy level. And the third is NYCHA, New York City Public Housing. That's it. There are only three forms, right? You know, interest in um, that you will have to live on. So to kind of answer your question, it'll mean that we, either from a federal level or state, which we don't do, right, we will have to change our policy on housing and how do we treat citizens as a whole and how do we fund from the $4.5 trillion budget in Washington to our $168 billion in the state plateau, right, which, you know, the percentage of that work, and over uh, $90 billion in the city, which the budget alone for the NYPD is $5 billion, Department of Education $24 billion, correct, right. So for us to do a massive homeowners, I'm thinking long term, in terms of that, that has to be a policy decision, it has to be financially, in terms of whether through the city alone could not build only so many homes through HPD for affordable housing. So you know we have the 80-20 rule where the landlord and developer gets to have 80, 20, and 20 people, 20% 20 will go to affordable housing, and then the other 80 to market free. All of that is because of the fact that the developer, the Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, they can close. I'll close with this. You cannot say to a <coughs> homeowner who has a building, if your mom left you a building, a six storage building, and you are the rent control build, you know, program, and you decide, hey, I want to go corporate, I want to sell this building. You know, you really can challenge that from a constitutional perspective, the taking clause, where the government will have to compensate you if they want to uh, take your property or deny you from really moving your program out of the HPD program or so forth. So I'll let Flacho answer a bit of it, but it's just a larger issue that we don't address in our country. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 we don't respect the right of housing. Yep. Okay, I'll zero in on just one key issue that I think we're not paying enough attention to. It's called AMI, Area Median Income. What we're calling affordable is not affordable because they're setting the income brackets too high. And there's no, it's not a law, it's policy. And it can be changed. And there have been a couple of instances in New York City where the local community pushed back and got and got the government to lower the definition okay. of affordable. So I think that's a strategy that we as residents let our elected officials know we want these numbers lowered, okay, mm -hmm. and, and advocating that same policy with the age, housing agencies that are overseeing the process. But AMI, we have to lower the definition of affordable so that those of us that are on the verge of displacement can actually move into these new apartments at our income level when they do become available. And also, energy, energy efficiency can also help uh, lower um, utility costs in the thank, thank, thank you very much. Please, please, please join me in thanking our guests, uh, our speakers, uh, uh, Ms. Raya Salter, Dr. John Plateau, Professor Gregorio Mayers, and thank you to our students for participating as well. Uh, that is the end of our policy presentation program. It is now my uh, pleasure to turn the microphone over to Dr. Derek Skeet. I'm pleased to say that in addition to being moderator, I'm also uh, Dr. Skeet's uh, style consultant. And, uh, I did a pretty good job today. Don't you think? Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Folks, I mean, this was a wonderful day. I mean, I, I, I gotta say that, that this was a wonderful day. I, I, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good. To the students in the audience, this is the opportunity that you have been waiting on all day. Two things, I'm gonna call Mr. Akin Flinch, who's gonna, number one, announce the winner of the hashtag competition, and number two, he's gonna be coordinating the 45 second pitch competition for both the high school students and the college students. So Akeem, you're gonna come and just announce the winner of the, um, of the pitch, of the hashtag competition before we do the pitch. All right, uh, are you guys doing? Akeem? Yeah, all right. Uh, 
So this person's been active all day on uh, Instagram, hashtagging uh, MC John Gibbs, and it's um, Miriam. Where's Miriam? Oh, no, she's over there. She's over there. She's over there. Opportunities you saw today, uh, feasibility and creativity. So, if you saw a business opportunity that you like, or a research opportunity, or an opportunity to come and do something at Mecca, come up. You have 45 seconds, and we got some great prizes. I promise they're great, but <laughs> we got some great prizes. You could just line up right here if you want to participate. Any high school students who. All right, so she said it now. I didn't want to say some cash. So if you want to come up with some cash, you got to just come up with 45 seconds. You know? Mega students, mega students, college students. Anyone in the audience? Anyone? I see y'all trying to get up, but y'all. Unless y'all want me to talk about something. Yeah, we got, we got a lot of things out here. Nobody else. No, no high school. Hungry. Got a monkey. I used to be hungry at high school, man. I used to come up with no money. Follow us on Instagram, especially y'all. 
high school people. I know y'all like social media. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Randolph Twelves from Professor Rodriguez's class, which is Biotech 211. What I heard about all from the conference is that the Green New Deal, it sounds like, like a like a environmental life, but in my heart, if I heard about um, Ryan Salter said about from against Trump administration, you see, I don't like Donald Trump, by the way. Donald Trump always is a, is a sorry behind. He always kept saying, let's make America great again. But this is Mega Evers College. We are the life to continue the world with because I respect my faith to the world. And that's my life because my life I will continue to educate to be one. Hello, my name is Andrean Hall. Um, I was told that I need to be here because I was in a chemistry class. Um, initially, my teacher said that, you know, you never know where life's gonna take you, so it's an event that we should come out to support, and that's why I'm here, and I think that I've learned so much from today. Resilience, relationships, um, just so many things, what we can do with science, and I'm happy to be here at Megar Evans. Alright, so we're just going to do this because we don't have time. We don't have time for judges. We're going to do this just based off of crowd. So I don't know what 12 is, who I imagine he's here too. So um, I'm going to go over the head and you guys make noise for who you guys like the most. So my boy right here. No, this is just, no, this is not, this is just for college students. College students, college students. We separated. So, can I do it again? All right, let's make some noise for the homeboy right here. All right, my lovely lady over here. Oh, okay. We got a winner. We got a winner. We got a one more time. One more time. One more time. Come right here. $100 gift card, which is going to be going to Miss Hall. Second prize is a $75 gift card. And the third prize, is that the young man? Yes. Yes. Metro card loaded with $50. So we are going to do the scene. 
same for our high schoolers and middle schoolers in the audience. Oh, I see people coming up now that they, got, they know there's money, all right. <laughs> On the line, ooh, okay. So who's first, who's first? <laughs> so what's your name? Zachary. All right, first, we got Zachary. Good afternoon. I learned that um, in the abundance of water, a fool is thirsty by Bob Marley. And that's significant to me because um, I'm Jamaican. And I learned about um, the lady the school lady that um, she made up a solution that water from natural disasters wouldn't mess with the water from the sewer system. And um, I learned about Con Edison and Capital One National Bank saying something about like they're sponsoring people that like want to do like investments and stuff. I hated environmental science. I really didn't think environmental science should be. But then today, um, really, um, I actually want to become a mechanical engineer. I didn't realize how much mechanical engineering had to do with the environment. And just knowing how water and like water systems are so involved within everything and how the environment is really the future of everything. Because if you waste the environment, what's the world? Um, <laughs> Oh, all right. Um, so thank you for this um, this event. Um, I really actually learned a lot about environmental science, and um, hopefully when I take this AP exam, it's a four or five. Right on the dot. Forty-five seconds. Jimmy. Uh, all right, we've got Marlene next on the stage. You got forty-five seconds. actually from Mr. Burnett's class. Um, uh, okay, so I've learned through, well, Dr. Pratt's presentation that based on how they are going to create a program to help us preserve more fossil fuels with the biodiesel, I've also learned that through the Catskill Delaware Reservoir, over 50% of the water that we use in the, you know, that we use in New York is from that reservoir, and over 1 billion gallons of water is pumped through that reservoir to New York. All right. We got Lance next. Hey everybody. <laughs> uh, I just gotta tell you, this whole event opened my eyes in many ways. I'm telling you. I learned so much about investment. I always wanted to do a little bit of investment when I was like when I get a little older and so forth and so forth. Like how to show how Capital One, if you're um, knowledgeable and able to um, and your um, product is good, they will use you and they will um, share something because they know they're gonna pay you back. And I got a shout out to Mr. Burnett. Like, you, like, I got, you hold it down for me. You always be there for me. And I ain't going front, man. <laughs> Thank you. But anyway, one more time. Okay, so, um, what, what kind of 
<laughs> what can I really say? Um, yeah, my time is not right yet. We got a double presentation, all right. No, oh, no, one at a time? Oh, he's a cameraman. All right, all right, all right. So we got publicity here, all right, man. What's your name? Tyler. So we got Tyler coming to the stage. I'm nervous. attention was about the cannabis and that if it's legal, a lot of businesses will be, you know, people will be able to make more money. And, I'm like, <laughs> and also about like creating your own business, how you have to follow the trends, brainstorm.
Okay, let's give a round of applause to all of the competitors, both college and high school students. I know some of you today, when we were on our way out the hallway, you saw the posters that were lying. Now, the students were very much involved in working with their professors. And of course, I would like to announce the winners of the poster competition, and I have the results with me here right now. The first, the third place winner is Love It. They can make up. The second place winner is Asuma Jalo. And the first place winner is Mr. Moyes Rodriguez. the first, second, and third prize, which is a laptop, a tablet, and a Fitbit, did not arrive on time. <laughs> That's the spirit, I love that. So without saying anything else, we will start with the prize of... We'll contact the winner. We have... Four $25 gift cards. So we're going to do the wrap right now. So take out your tickets. I'm sure that when I'm not picking out the tickets, I'll just call on people at random to come to on stage and pick out a ticket. This is one of our faculty members in the Chemistry and Environmental Science. Pick out the first ticket. Three, 
One more gift certificate, 50 dollars. Three, three, eight, eight, 
And any staff who holds that number agrees to go again to one of our students or staff members, other than faculty, will get it. Just just shrink that out. Three three eight seven nine one. Three three eight seven nine one. Eight eight five three. Three three eight eight five three. Three three nine one nine one. But that said, I hope I kept my promise of providing you an enlightened and an enlightening, fun-filled day with relevant information. Thank you. <laughs> but I would like to present two awards to two very deserving individuals. The first individual I would like you on to the engine in a car. We see the fancy car running, but often we don't see the work the engine is doing behind the scenes. So for that reason, I would like to present a hard-working, well-oiled engine of this conference for over 20 years, Mr. Mohammed Bangura. qualifications and work ethics, but his willingness to reach across the lines to promote science entrepreneurship collaborations among faculty, researchers, and college students. That person is Dr. Sam Groveman. <laughs> Sam is responsible for putting that video together and maintaining all of our research facilities. John Gibbs Award presented to Dr. Sam Groveman in recognition of your contribution towards innovation and science.